Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Uh, it's an honor. I presented at the uh, mid-year seminar in October, and a lot of people enjoyed my presentation, and they felt that we need more presentations on lifestyle. So here I am, back, talking more about lifestyle. So uh, I did not get my training in lifestyle medicine through my college or through my medical school or through residency. I got it through other venues myself. I did some research, I did some reading, and I also joined the Institute of Functional Medicine. I'm going through my board certification. So there's a lot of places to learn lifestyle medicine. Now, how many people actually practice lifestyle medicine in their practice? Who teaches their patients on diet, exercise, well-being? And, and unfortunately, how many of you learned it in medical school? I don't see any hands. So hopefully the future of our medical school, osteopathic school, will be to learn or to teach lifestyle. So the way I look at lifestyle medicine, there's four pillars of lifestyle medicine. Uh, nutrition, which is your diet, your nutritional status, your digestion, your gut, uh, activity or exercise, mental health. You know, how happy are you? Are you stressed? Uh, do you have a meaningful life? Do you feel like you know, have a spiritual connection and exposure. So those are the four pillars of lifestyle. We're going to spend most of our time on nutrition and we'll touch on some of the other ones. Um, and this is evidence-based medicine. I work in a medical system. We have about a thousand physicians and there's a lot of different ideas of what is evidence-based medicine and what is not. I've worked with some rheumatologists and my patients told me, hey, you know, this rheumatologist thinks that, you know, you're an osteopath, you're not really practicing evidence-based medicine. It's, uh, you're, you're doing diet and exercise, that's not real medicine. Well, I'm gonna show you today, diet, exercise, and mental health is evidence-based medicine. And this is the way I practice. This is the way I practice at my spine center. This is what I teach my patients and I hope you bring this back and teach your patients as well. So we're going to talk about Miss Typical. Miss Typical is a 60-year-old female uh, who showed up to my clinic with new onset of severe back pain, six months, and chronic neck pain and knee pain. Uh, we did some imaging, did some testing, did some physical exam, and she has a chronic lumbar compression fracture. She has osteoporosis, cervical arthritis, some knee arthritis, sedentary lifestyle. She eats the standard American diet known as SAD. Um, yes, she has GERD, so of course, you know, she has to be on a PPI, depression, so on Zoloft, and high cholesterol, lipid, uh, so she's on Lipitor. So this is, according to some of my colleagues, evidence-based medicine, right? Who's seen Ms. Typical in their clinic? I see her every day. So this is a nice joke. I keep finding these all over, my, all over the house. Well, my doctor says bone loss is normal at my age. Is it really? You know, and I'm going to talk to you about it. Can we do things? Can our lifestyle influence our bones? Right? And we're going to talk about that quite a bit. So this is my lifestyle medicine prescription for our patient. Physical therapy, obviously I'm a physiatrist. Daily walking outside or maybe some biking. Core food plan. We have many different food plans that we use. Our core food plan is more like a Mediterranean diet. It's our, usually our introductory diet for most of our patients. Then we have some other ones like mitochondrial food plans, elimination diets. But this is the one we start off with. Bone broth. I have my patients do bone broth. Uh, morning green smoothies. Taper off Nexium. Meditation. Uh, some hopefully maybe working on getting off the Zoloft and avoidance of toxins. So this was my lifestyle prescription to the patient who came in with a compression fracture and arthritis. And I'm going to show you, this is evidence-based medicine. So I'm not a bone doctor, I'm not a brain doctor, I'm not a gut doctor or a vascular doctor, I'm not a dietitian. I'm an osteopath. I'm a whole body doctor, right? That's what we are, whole body, mind, and spirit. That's what makes us osteopaths. And that's, that's what I'm going to show you, how everything is connected. So this was in, in October, as I mentioned, I was on temp on one of the presentations, and I took my son to the Children's Museum. And there he is, putting together some bones. And this was pretty cool, because the first layer was bones, then it was a vascular system, then the guts, and then the skin. And it's a nice real way to show our kids, hey, everything is connected. And he was learning. At six years old, he's learning. Everything is connected. So let's talk about the skeletal system. The skeletal system is our framework. It gives us our mobility, uh, stores energy, releases minerals, produces blood cells. Pretty important. As osteopaths, we definitely know this. 
So let's talk a little bit more detail. What are bones? Bones are made of many different things, and we have to think about it. Always everybody thinks, you know, what's most important for bone health? Everyone says calcium. Well, calcium is only maybe, you know, 20% of your bones. What about all the other things? The collagen, type 1, the different minerals, the water, the cells, and then the nutrients that you need to maintain. And same thing with the joints. You got the cartilage, the subchondral bone. Who thinks about the subchondral bone when you're thinking about arthritis? Extremely important, right? If that's not strong enough, guess what? The arthritis will get worse. Uh, synovial membranes and capsules. So let's talk about collagen, the first part. Collagen gives us our bones the tensile strength, gives us the flexibility. It's kind of like the lettuce of, of the building. It's, it's what holds it all together. Collagen type 1 is the collagen found in bone. It's about 28% of bone. That's a big chunk of bone. So again, are we always thinking about calcium, calcium for bone? Is there other things? How do we support collagen in our, in our, in our body? Collagen is made of amino acids like hydroxyproline, glycine, lysine, hydroxylysine, uh, and it's all wound up in this triple helix. And a triple helix is actually held there together by hydroxylysine, and this is a vitamin C dependent process, right? If we don't have enough, enough vitamin C, that's not going to happen. Our collagen is going to be weak. So can we do something about our collagen? Well, nutritional amino acids actually improve collagen synthesis. Uh, this is a study looked at patients. Uh, they, put, they cut their bice, or sorry, the deltoids open. They put some tubes in there, and they measure, measured their collagen content after seven days and 14 days. And the patients that were receiving the collagen or the amino acids actually made more collagen. They were growing more collagen. They were able to actually help their body heal faster. So what do we do? You know, what, what, how can we give collagen? You know, I, I prescribe bone broth. My wife cooks delicious bone broth. She cooks bone broth for anywhere 24 to 36 hours, and I teach my patients. Bon, we, the bones we use, we use chicken bones or beef bones. We usually, always use organic bones because the non-organic bones have, are, are, have more uh, heavy metals and other things. So we use organic bones to cook our bone broth. And the bone broth has the amino acids, the proline, lysine, also has glycoamino, glycosaminoglycans, chondroitin, keratin, hyaluronic acid. Who's heard of those? Right? What are those needed for? Right? Our joints. We give them in pills to our patients. I tell my patients, make bone broth. Right? Bone broth, after uh, eating it for about, uh, after one or two hours, you get peak, peak plasma concentration. Uh, and it stays in your, in your plasma for about four to six hours. It really gets there where it needs to. So bone, collagen has actually been shown to help healing, uh, healing bones. And it decreases bone loans in women with osteopenia, increases bone strength. And this is more, they, they, th and these studies uh, I'm going to show you, they took the bone broth and then they dried it out and they gave it to him in dry pills to see, you know, because you always have to blind everybody. So, but it, again, goes back to bone broth, giving the patients amino acids. Uh, collagen hydrolysates, again, it has been shown to stimulate osteoblasts and, and osteo, uh, osteoblasts to actually create more, um, more extracellular matrix. Collagen hydrocellate is safe and provides improvement in pain and function in men with osteoarthritis. So collagen has been studied. Again, this is a double-blind study of 250 subjects. Uh, they, half of them got the collagen and half of them did not. And the ones that did get the collagen would actually have improvement in their knee pain and improvement in their function, improvement in uh, or d decreased deterioration. And this was best in patients who had actually the worst arthritis and the people that were eating the least like at least collagenous diets, so people that were not eating any meat or not any ligaments or anything like that, they did the best with the supplementation. So the next thing, let's talk about the minerals, right? The hardness, this is what gives us the, 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 the I guess the hardness and the strength as well. And that's the ground substance, the hydrox, uh, hydroxyapatite, that's the calcium and phosphorus. You can think of the minerals like the concrete. You have a little bit of gravel, a little bit of sand, a little bit of sand, cement, and some water. So let's talk a little bit about the ground substance. And we start talking about calcium, right? Everyone always talks about calcium for bone health. Is calcium the answer? And there's, there's some good evidence. So earlier studies show that intake of milk can actually help kids have stronger bones. Women with low intake during childhood had some associations with actually uh, decreased bone mass and some frequency of milk consumption before age 25 favorably, favorably influence hip bone mass. Well, these were some of the earlier studies, okay? Later on, we found out maybe that's not the case. Oh no, I think maybe we are wrong. 
based on meta-analysis, uh, actually there was no overall association with milk intake and hip fracture risk in women, even at high milk intakes. Actually, it was the opposite. This was a study published in JAMA. Milk consumption during teenage years was not associated with lower ri risk of hip fracture. Instead, a significant 9% increase risk observed in men for each additional glass of milk. So I don't feel very comfortable telling my patients drink milk. So I don't prescribe milk to my patients, my elder patients, my younger patients. I prescribe greens. I feel very comfortable with greens. Greens have lots of calcium. If you look at some, this, this chart right here, you know, some of the highest, or foods with the highest content of calcium, tofu, collard greens, spinach, gre uh, turnip greens, mustard greens, beet greens, bok choy, these are all excellent sources of calcium, and they also come with magnesium and other micronutrients. So I prescribe these to my patients instead of milk. What about calcium supplements? How many how many of you know patients on calcium supplements? Well, calcium supplements has not been really shown to significantly change bone mineral density. Uh, calcium supplementation actually has not been shown to decrease fractures either. Meta-analysis of calcium supplementation suggests an increased risk of fracture. And then who's heard of the, the studies in the cardiovascular journals where actually calcium supplements increase risk of heart attack? and stroke, right? It's out there, right? So we too much, it's, it's too much, too much gravel. Do we want to just load them up? No, we, it's got to be a healthy balance. Again, I prescribe green vegetables. Fruits and vegetables have calcium, magnesium, all the other minerals that we need. Higher intake of fruits and vegetables has a positive effect of bone mineral status in younger and older women. Phosphorus was the other part, so that's the sand of, of the cement. Uh, it's 85% of phosphorus is stored in, stored in bone, found in protein-rich foods, uh, may become deficient in the elderly. It's the sand, right? So where do we get phosphorus? These are more, more of the protein-rich foods, like scallops, some seafood, mushrooms. I prescribe mushrooms all the time. Who, how many of you actually prescribe mushrooms to your patients? So I work at a pain and a spine clinic, and we always see radiculopathy or other nerve damage or other things. So besides giving our patients you know, phosphorus and other things, mushrooms actually increase nerve growth factor. Did you guys know that? Yeah, so there's some pretty cool studies. The, the one that's been studied the most is the lion's mane, like the lion's mane. It's a mushroom that you can actually get in powder on a mushroom, and that has been shown to actually increase nerve growth factor. There have been studies looking at fibular nerve damage uh, in animals, and uh, animals on the mushrooms actually grew their nerves quicker. So food is medicine, prescribed mushrooms. So let's talk about the trace minerals, right? The, the bonus also has some other things like magnesium, sodium, potassium, zinc, uh, fluoride, magnesium. Uh, how many of you actually have patients using magnesium? You know, we can get them from food. Sometimes we do use it in pills. Magnesium helps to move the calcium into the bones from the soft tissue, uh, stimulates osteoblast, osteoblasts, and decreases osteoclast activity. About 50% of U.S. population actually is low on magnesium. Okay, they don't even reach the recommended daily allowance of 320 milligrams. So magnesium deficiency is associated, or it actually is associated with impaired bone growth, scale of fragility, and some osteopenia. And this is a nice study looking at women and their f food intake that are rich in magnesium and potassium. And the first part of that slide on your left, uh, it's, the, it's the baseline. And the women with the quartile on, on the right of that, uh, of that chart, have the highest intake of magnesium, and they've been shown to have the highest bone mineral density. And then they looked at these women four years later, and they found that actually the women in the highest quartile of magnesium intake were actually losing a lot less bone than the women with the lowest quartile. So again, you know, let's prescribe vegetables and foods that are high in magnesium, spinach, green, it goes back to the greens. How many of you prescribe greens to your patients? There you go, I love it, yes. I prescribe greens to my patients every day, uh, and I, follow my own prescription. So zinc, zinc is another uh, micronutrient that we need for bone health. It's essential mineral at, that acts in multiple enzymatic reactions needed by, by fibroblasts to actually to create bone. It's needed for proper calcium absorption. And zinc deficiency in children has actually been shown to growth retardation. These bones don't grow very well without the zinc. We need these micronutrients. So zinc status is actually lower in some women with osteoporosis. 
and it, the level of zinc can be correlated sometimes to mineral bone, bone mineral density. And patients with thalassemia who actually have low levels of zinc, when you supplement with zinc, uh, you can actually improve their bone mineral density. So zinc actually has been studied for multiple things. It improves fracture healing. This is a randomized double blind placebo trial of 60 patients. Half of them got zinc, half of them got a control. And they found that patients on the zinc supplementation would form a callus pretty quicker. And they would actually, their bone fracture would heal quicker. So I don't prescribe zinc pills to my patients. Um, I prescribe foods that are high in zinc. Again, beef, and I do go for or organic, I always, I uh, ask my patients to eat organic meats because in, in animals, they bioaccumulate toxins. So if you have these cows eating this, these, these, these foods that are laden with toxins, they actually accumulate in their bones and their meats and their fats. So with the organic meats, we tend to have, be a little bit safer. I don't tell my patients to eat a lot of meat, just a little bit, just to get their requirements of zinc. But also we can do spinach, asparagus, back to mushrooms. Mushrooms are high in zinc, so I prescribe mushrooms on a regular basis. So does protein actually adversely affect our bone? Uh, there are some thoughts that protein actually increases the acidity in, in your blood. So then the calcium is taken out of your bones, goes into your blood to neutralize it. And then they realized that wasn't the case. The calcium wasn't actually coming out of your bones. The calcium was actually coming from your gut. So when you eat a diet that's got a little bit more meat and you need to neutralize it, you usually actually your, your body absorbs more calcium from the gut and from the vegetables. So if you eat some vegetables with your meat, it neutralizes that acidity. So that whole idea that you lose bones when you eat uh, meat is, is wrong, it has never been shown to be correct. So I'm not a vegetarian. I don't follow a paleo diet. I walk the middle path, right? I like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and in the middle path, it allows me to really be able to go in any direction. You know, there are so many physicians in our group that are, oh, I'm a vegetarian, strict vegan. I actually went vegetarian for three months, and then I did a, a micronutrient study on myself. And I found after that three months, I was low on B vitamins, and I was low on CoQ10 and other things. So it wasn't for my body. Some bodies do well on vegetarian diets. Some bodies don't. So we always have to really address the patient, you know, each treat, each, each individual. I prescribe real food, just eat real food, mostly plants, not too much, just like Michael Pollan. Who's heard of Michael Pollan in the past? Yeah, he's written some beautiful books. So this, this, is, this is our core food plan. This is where we start off most of our patients, and then we can veer off one way or another. You know, lots of vegetables, some healthy proteins, some healthy grains. Sometimes patients need to be off grains if they're gluten intolerant. Uh, you know, some, sometimes a little bit of wine is okay, too. Again, going back to uh, in Tampa, when I took my son to the Children's Museum, they had a pretty cool place for kids to learn about health, and this was pretty nice. Can I eat a rainbow? So I teach my patients to eat a rainbow of colors. The more colors, the more variation of colors you have, the more antioxidants, the more nutrients you get. So can you eat a rainbow every day? What about vitamin D? We always hear about vitamin D and bone health and everything else health. So vitamin D optimizes calcium absorption. It stabilizes the calcium within our bone matrix. It actually regulates the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And deficiency can increase bone turnover. So low levels are found to people with in people with osteoporosis. And this is the one place where actually supplementation has been shown to be beneficial. The one place where if you give your patients who are low on vitamin D a little bit of supplement, it can actually help them with their bone mineral density and their, decrease their fracture risk. Same thing with arthritis. Vitamin, low vitamin D intake has been a risk factor for worsening of arthritis. And in patients where they measure their vitamin D levels and then they follow them for a couple years, the patients whose vitamin D level keeps on going lower or gets low have been shown to actually get worsening of their arthritis. So you can have some food sources of vitamin D, some, some protein, some, again, mushrooms. Again, we're going to go back to mushrooms constantly, uh, eggs and cheese. But I prescribe sunshine vitamin, right? I prescribe my patients, go outside, don't put on any sunblock in the morning. If they don't have skin cancer, you know, if they do, maybe there's a different story. But I tell them, go outside and enjoy the sun. Go walk outside, breathe, enjoy nature, commune with nature. I prescribe it to myself, too, during my lunch hour or, I'm sorry, my lunch 15 minutes. 
Um, I take five minutes or ten minutes, go outside, get some sunshine, and uh, you know, do that between, between patients. Uh, you can actually get 10,000 units of vitamin D uh, midday if you're f almost full body exposure in the sunshine. Okay? So obviously can't do that during lunch, can't go out there in my you know, briefs and get sunshine, but you can tell your patients if you don't have skin cancer, go out there and get some sunshine until your skin gets just a little tiny bit red. Boom, there's 10,000 units, right, like that. The other thing we need to do is water, and that's going to remind me, I need water as well. So dehydration of bone actually increases its stiffness and it increases its fragility. So how many of your patients are dehydrated? What, what is our typical uh, uh, requirement for water intake? What do you think? There's, there's an easy way my dietician uh, taught me. So take your weight in pounds and divide it in half, and that's how many ounces of water they should be drinking. Okay, so if someone is about 160 pounds, they should be probably drinking about 80 ounces of water per day. So that's about 10 glasses a day. I teach that to my patients all the time. Here in Florida, we see a lot of people are dehydrated, right? And people are outdoors, and they're very dehydrated. Actually, um, during Irma, our hospital was constantly admitting people with renal failure, right? Because people were not drinking enough water. So help you. Especially, yeah, during Irma, they were out there putting them, you know, uh, they were cleaning up their house, and yes, they, they were dehydrated. So, yeah, so now let's talk about the bone cells, the working crew, right? The osteoblasts, the osteoclasts, you know, the, these are the guys that are there constantly doing their job. And we have to support them, and we support them with different micronutrients. And actually, oxidative stress can influence them as well, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So osteoblasts are our bone builders, right? They synthesize the collagen, they form the mineral matrix, the hydroxyapatite we talked about, and they secrete different stimulating hormones such as osteocalcin. Who's used osteocalcin in their patients, right? Well, we can actually stimulate our own cells to do that uh, by vitamin K, right? It's a vitamin K dependent process. And then you have the osteoclasts. Those are the guys that are gonna break things down. Those are the destructors. Uh, they secrete collagen degrading enzymes and they actually use some of the free radicals to break down bone. And we need them, again, when we have an injury or when we need to change the, our, our bone structure. So we, we need a healthy balance, that's right. So there's that never-ending construction site, right? There's bone remodeling constantly going on. And not only is it constantly going on, but we also need to stimulate it. And we stimulate it by pressure, right? Someone who just sits around and does nothing, there's no stimulation. So we got to get into that piezoelectric effect, right? You remember that from medical school? The piezoelectric effect, you put pressure on the bone, there's a lot of electricity going through the bone and it stimulates the osteoblasts and osteoclasts to do their job. So we need to do that with our patients and need to teach them. So oxidative stress, as I said, influences these, these cells. Oxidative stress is, or oxidation is normal within our body during um, you know, when we're exposed to infections or when we eat or, do, or when our uh, white blood cells are fighting infections, they actually spray out a bunch of free radicals to, to kill those bugs, the kill the bacteria and the viruses. So we need to be able to neutralize them. So when we have too much free radicals, we are in oxidative stress. When we neutralize them, then we're not in oxidative stress. And uh, oxidative stress actually influences these cells. So ox osteoclasts produce free radicals, like I said, when there's a bone fracture or the bone needs to be changed, they produce these free radicals. And free radicals actually stimulate more osteoclasts. So increased levels of free radicals have actually been shown to neg negatively affect fracture healing. And, while di and dietary antioxidants have been shown to help healing, right? You know, my surgeons, uh, our spine surgeons don't operate on smokers. You know, smokers have a lot of oxidative stress. If you want oxidative stress, go out there and smoke. You, great way to get oxidative stress. They don't operate on them because they don't heal, right? Uh, the, the fracture, or I'm sorry, the fractures, the, the fusions, the spinal fusions, they, there's been shown, they've been shown to actually fail on people who smoke. So we really need to control oxidative stress. Uh, women, with osteoporosis have uh, increased oxidative stress and there's a negative correlation with oxidative stress index and bone mineral density. And again, going back to the smokers who have lots of free radicals, the ones that don't protect their bones with any uh, antioxidants, they have been shown to have increased fractures. I'm not telling my patients to go smoke and eat a bunch of blueberries, I just say don't smoke. <laughs> So how else can we get oxidative stress? So 
if you go to McDonald's, get yourself a unhappy meal, get some soda, a burger, some fries, and bam, you're gonna have some oxidative stress for about six hours. Your body just goes nuts. Um, you know, all the fats and all those extra proteins and sugars, they increase oxidative stress. So think about our patients. Go to McDonald's or somewhere for breakfast, then they go somewhere for lunch and for dinner, and they're oxidative stress all day, right? They're just living in oxidative stress. So here's a study looking at patients taking some blueberries. So they went to McDonald's, and boom, their, their oxidative, actually their antioxidant status went down. But when they ate, ate the blueberries, it helped them kind of neutralize it. So I'm not telling my patients, go eat blueberries and go to McDonald's. I'm just saying, skip the McDonald's. So we can get antioxidants from our foods. Some of the foods that are highest in antioxidants are the berries. I, I prescribe berries every day to my patients. How many of you prescribe berries to your patients? Yes, I love this. I, I love that show of hands. Yeah, berries are a great way. And I usually ask my patients to go to uh, the freezer section and get the little tiny blueberries, right? The little ones that are frozen wild. Those, those have been shown to have probably twice as much uh, antioxidant content than the big ones that you get you know, in, in, in the fresh part. Um, or go to the forest. We were in, in Poland, my wife and I and my son, we were in Poland and hiking the mountains and there was blueberry fields everywhere. We, our mouth, our hands, everything was blue. We were having a great time. We were just living the antioxidant dream. <laughs> what else can we do? We have the DNA whisper. So not only do these foods directly affect the oxidative stress, they actually talk to our genes. They talk, they whisper to our genes, and they produce, uh, they talk to the genes of this protein, the NRF2 protein. Who's heard of NRF2 protein? It's it's very hot topic right now. It's like this powerhouse of antioxidation. And these, these, these foods whisper to these genes and say, hey, why don't, why don't you turn on and fight this, uh, this oxidative stress? And great foods like turmeric, um, Cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. I prescribe broccoli to my patients. Seasons, right? I tell my patients there's a reason to season. I usually tell them use spices, use uh, cumin, curcumin, and anything else you can. The uh, uh, quercetin, which is found in the onions and um, blueberries, of course. I prescribe blueberries all the time. Now, what about vitamin C? Vitamin C is needed for, like I said, hydrolyxation of the proline and lysine. So we talked about the collagen, it's a triple helix. Well, vitamin C is needed to do that, right? So people that don't have vitamin C can't make that collagen properly. Um, vitamin C has been shown to actually help uh, with the production and stimulation of osteoblasts. So these little cells are just waiting, give me some vitamin C to start working. So let's, let's feed them, right? And unfortunately, we live you know, there's a deficiency in the land of access. We live in a land of access, right? America is a land of access, yet we are so incredibly deficient. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, in 2003, there was a study of 7,000 people, and 7.1% of them were vitamin C deficient. There's another study of 500 people, about 6 of them, 6% 6 were deficient. Again, our patients are not getting enough vitamin C, and we need to get that from, from the foods. And what are the symptoms of vitamin C deficiency? Fatigue, swollen joints, muscle and bone aches, bone fragility, bleeding, emotional uh, changes. How many of you see patients like this, right? Well, maybe doing a little micronutrient testing is not a bad idea. We use a, a lab called, uh, actually maybe I shouldn't say, but there is a micronutrient testing lab you can find locally. Um, there's one in Houston that we use. Uh, and all, that's all it is. You do, you do a blood, blood draw and they check the micronutrients inside their white blood cells. So that tells us how their micronutrient status was for the last three months. And then it helps us to identify, well, where do we really need to focus on? So antioxidants and osteoarthritis. Moderate to high intake of vitamin C has been associated with lower risk of developing pain in knee arthritis. And high intake of dietary antioxidants and micronutrients, especially vitamin C, may reduce the risk of cartilage loss. So again, vitamin C is needed, like we said, those osteoblasts, chondrocytes. And where do we get this vitamin C? I'm not going to tell my patients get a pill. I'm going to tell them to get, a, get food. Papayas, bell peppers, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. So um, I think it was Dr. Lin who did bunch of really cool studies on vitamin C and, and micronutrients. And in his research, he was comparing vitamin C supplements to an apple. And he found the apple that had about maybe 15 to 20 milligrams of vitamin C 
was as strong as fighting free radicals as a thousand milligrams of a pill of vitamin C. Okay, so those huge doses of vitamin C, they may be effective for some things, like some cancer treatments and other things have been, there are some, some people using that, uh, IV vitamin C, but again, get it from the food. It comes with all the other micronutrients. It's, it's the array of nutrients and, and minerals that makes it more effective. So that vitamin C by itself is not going to work as well as if it is with, within the magnesium and all the other things. So again, food. Food is medicine. So now what happens to these antioxidants, right? So the way we process them makes a difference too. Now how many of you keep the peel on of your cucumbers? When you eat a cucumber, do you keep your peel on or you peel it off? Peel on, yes. Well, that's, that's good. So the, a lot of the antioxidants are actually found in the outer surface of the fruits and vegetables, right? Why? Why do you think the antioxidants are found on the outer surface where they have to protect themselves? What do you think? Because that's how fruits and vegetables protect themselves from invaders. So when bugs come in and bite these, anti, these, these plants and vegetables, the plants... <laughs> put all these antioxidants on the outside and on their peels and that's, that's their protective layer. So that's the one that's the richest when we, when we eat foods, that's the richest part of, our, of the antioxidants. Um, it has been shown that actually organic versus non-organic fruits and vegetables, there's a difference in the antioxidant level. So the, these non-organic fruits and vegetables, they're hanging out in their little soil, all safe, they don't have to worry about bugs because nobody's biting them because they have pesticides all over them, so they don't produce all these antioxidants, right? And then you have the organic ones, like, oh my God, I got to struggle. So they're struggling to survive and they're just producing all these antioxidants and they have a higher, higher volume. So I usually tell my patients, if you can afford it, eat organic because they are going to be more powerful, right? Um, same thing with, you know, what do you do with them? Steaming or, or cooking. Typically, you don't want to overcook your vegetables. Steaming a little bit can, is, is fine. Like broccoli, if you cook it for more than five or ten minutes, it loses a lot of its sulforaphane, a lot of that DNA whispering content. So food is energy, and energy can be lost with storage. So scientists took some lettuce, and they looked at the vitamin C content, and after three days of storage, in really good conditions, cold, dark, it lost about 50% of its vitamin C, and after seven days, it only had about 20 to 30 percent, right? Same thing with the free radical trapping ability. It went down significantly, three days and seven days. So they're like, well, what, what happens with people that actually eat this? So they fed this lettuce to patients and they took their blood and they measured their antioxidant value. And the same thing, you know, within uh, the blood levels of the antioxidants within two to three hours, are, uh, I'm sorry, the, after you eat the lettuce, the blood levels of the antioxidants raise pretty significantly within two to three hours if it's fresh lettuce, okay? But if, if it's, let's say, seven to 10 days, it tends to not do so, so much. So again, we really wanna eat fresh food. This is, this, is what, this is what the Vedic medicines talk about, prana. Who's heard of prana in the past? Okay, what is prana? Prana is the food energy. It's in what Ayurvedic medicine uh, you're being taught. Food is energy, and prana is the vital energy. It's qi in Chinese medicine. It's the breath of life, and it comes from, from sun. And this is in the Vedic text. It, uh, it's the sun gives energy to the vegetables, and then we get the energy from the sun to us. Sounds very spiritual, but it's very scientific, actually, okay? According to the physics, light is energy, we know that. And then the colors, they store the energy. The foods, the fruits and vegetables, that's how they store that energy. Actually, in the DNA of the fruits and, uh, fruits and vegetables, that's where, the color, uh, that's where the sun energy is stored. They store photons, okay? So when we're eating these fruits and vegetables, we want to see big, vibrant colors. The more color, the more powerful, the more prana we get, the more energy. That's why I tell my patients, go out and find a local farm and maybe sign up to your CSA. How many of you are part of a CSA? Community Sponsored Agriculture. Great way. We get a box every week. My wife and I, we're always excited. Every Wednesday we get our box and we open it up and it's like prana, right? It's energy, it just comes at us, right? And, and then we try to eat lettuce. We usually eat right away the first two days. We don't let it sit around too long because after three days, 50% of its vitamin C is gone, right? Prana, color, flavonoids. Whew. Okay, what about vitamin K? Vitamin K is made by plants and is most abundant in the green vegetables. Um, its name comes from coagulations vitamin. It's best known in coagulation, right? And it affects our bones. Vitamin K is needed for production of osteocalcin 
to stimulate the osteoblast. It stimulates the osteoblast, stimulates bone mineralization, stabilizes calcium within the matrix. So vitamin K has been shown to, or increased intake of vitamin K has been shown to decrease osteoporosis. And low vitamin K has been shown to increase fracture risk. So vitamin K and osteoarthritis also. Low diets of vitamin K have been shown to be a risk factor for uh, knee arthritis. And vitamin K is a protective role in knee arthritis. It's actually a disease-modifying agent. Who's heard of disease-modifying agents, right? In rheumatology, they're used all the time. I use disease-modifying agents every day. You know, this morning I had some disease-modifying agents when I was eating my broccoli and my, you know, my, uh, what do we have? We had uh, cucumbers with the peels on. So who is deficient in vitamin K? Well, plants make vitamin K1, and then we convert it, our bacteria in our gut converts it to vitamin K2, which is the active one. So diets that are low in vitamin K obviously makes you deficient, but people who've been on broad spectrum antibiotics, their guts, bacteria have been wiped out, and they can't convert that vitamin K1 to vitamin K2, right? So broad spectrum antibiotic use has been shown to increase the risk of vitamin K deficiency. Elderly just don't do it, and then patients on Coumadin. This is one of those medications I always struggle. When I have patients come in and I want to prescribe you green smoothies, and doctor, I'm on Coumadin, I can't have any greens. It's painful, it's painful. We usually try to kind of work with their physicians. Can you take something else? Or can we, you know, stabilize your green intake and still do your Coumadin? So I prescribe greens, right? Where, where, where do we get them? Kale, spinach, mustard greens, collard greens. I prescribe the green smoothie. I actually give my patients a recipe of the green smoothie. In, in my, we, have, we use Epic. Who uses Epic in, in, in your... Oh, I guess not. Well, you do. Okay. So in your computer system, you can have dot phrases. Dot green smoothie is mine. And it, it gives my patients the whole, the whole recipe of the green smoothie. And we have a green smoothie with, at our house every day. My son, six-year-old son, he green, drinks a green smoothie with, with me every day. He liked it for a while, then it got a little bitter for him. So now we do a race. We have glasses, and we, we, put, we put a straw. And I'm like, okay, let's see who goes faster. And we have our green smoothie every morning. And my son does it. No, no problems. So what about omega-3 fatty acids? Omega-3 fatty acids have also been shown to decrease uh, bone resorption. You know, omega-3 fatty acids are very important in inflammation. We have the omega-6s and the omega-3s. The omega-6s have been actually shown to increase inflammation. Uh, those are the ones that are found in, in some seed oils, um, animal products. And omega-3 actually decreases inflammation. So when you go out there and get beef, your, the beef or the meat it can actually have different contents of omega-3 versus omega-6 acids. So the pasture-raised, the grass-fed omega, I'm sorry, the grass-fed beef has actually been shown to have more omega-3 fatty acids, while the conventionally raised animals have more omega-6. So again, another reason to go organic to, to improve that inflammation uh, from your food. So I prescribe good stuff, right? The core food plan, again, a, little bit of veg a lot of vegetables, some meat, some, some grains. So here I am uh, at my son's school, and I encourage all of you to do this. Go to your kids' schools or your grandkids' schools and teach them about diet. Nobody, they're not going to hear it from anybody else. So they, here they are, they're all standing, holding their little piece of paper, and it's, it's their phytonutrient color spectrum. So the, and this, this is a calendar for one week, and they're supposed to mark off how many greens did we eat, how many yellows, how many reds, and then they all handed those in to me afterwards. So the, basically, every day they would mark off, I ate this many greens, this many yellows, these many purples. Purple and blue is probably the hardest for most patients. You know, how many, think about your own diet. Do you get purple and blue every day, okay? And those are probably some of the most powerful antioxidants. So it's gotta get this good stuff in, right? So how do we get it inside? Our gut, right? So all disease and health begins in the gut. So we digest, we absorb, eliminate, and keep the bad stuff out. So the gut, so the stomach, the stomach is like our little cooking pot, right? It, it cooks the soup. Um, it, 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 that's where all the digestion happens, and then you get the chyme, which is the soup. And very often, we got to also understand, you know, I, I like to prescribe a lot of vegetables and fruits to my patients, but in the elderly patients, that pot, that cooking pot, doesn't work as well. It doesn't get us hot. You know, when we're kids, we have, 
we have heat, we have all this energy to cook all that food. As we get older, that food doesn't, uh, our stomach is not able to cook as much. So I usually tell my patients, cook your food, eat warm food. If you're gonna eat your vegetables, steam it. It's a lot easier. We need to get that soup nice and hot so it can be digested. So, so we need stomach acid, right? Hydrochloric acid produced by parietal cells. It breaks down the proteins, kills the bacteria. And actually slow stomach acid, which is hypochlorohydria, can lead to nutritional deficiencies through decreased absorption. Deficiencies of magnesium, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin K. We just talked about that, right? We need stomach acid. You know, there's always this talk, oh, you have too much stomach acid, oh, it's bad. Stomach acid is not bad. Stomach acid is great. We need it, we need it in our stomach. We don't need it in our esophagus, but we are osteopaths, right? We know how to fix that. We know that the diaphragm is part of the esophageal gastric junction, right? And that helps to keep the stomach acid. So we can work on the diaphragm, work on the lower thoracics, teach them some diaphragmatic breathing exercises. We need stomach acid, just keep it in there, right? So we need to rest and digest. 30% of your stomach acid is produced with the cephalic phase. So when you think about the food, so when I think about my wife's cooking, I think about it, I smell it. My brain is already talking to my stomach through the vagus nerve and stimulating the parietal cells and 30% of the stomach acid is already starting to churn. So teach your patients, sit down, relax. Look at the guy on, on, the, on, the, on the right there. He's, you know, do you think he's making stomach acid? I think he's pouring acid on his, in his cereal. So what do we give patients for stomach acid? PPIs. How many of you have patients on PPIs? I bet you every one of them. Come on, don't, don't be shy. Every one of your, I mean, everyone has patients on PPIs. They decrease absorption of B vitamins, magnesium, iron, calcium. There's multiple studies. This is a study in Canada of 10,000 patients. PPI use has been associated with increased fracture risk. Meta-analysis has shown the same thing. What about absorption? So now, not only do we need to cook the soup, digest it with some stomach acid, then we need to absorb it, right? Absorb the nutrients. So we talked about all the foods that we need. We talked about cooking them, then we need to absorb them into our body. And we do that through our intestines. But intestinal disease have been shown to actually be a risk factor for osteoporosis. Mal my digestion and malabsorption, so celiac disease, gastrectomy, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, all of these things can actually affect the way you bring in those nutrients to your bones. So what do we do? We teach them lifestyle ways to, te to, to help with GERD. We do avoid triggers. Avoid triggers, do elimination diets that have eliminate the GERD. I do elimination diets for people with inflammatory bowel disease, right? Obviously, gluten is a big one, but how many of you knew that dairy is a, is a trigger for Crohn's disease, right? So there's lots of study that looked at milk and dairy consumption. When you eliminate that, their, their, their flares go down significantly. So anyone on in, inflammatory bowel disease needs to go through an elimination diet. And there's studies and studies showing how effective these are, right? Uh, rest and digest and use some calming herbs too. So we talked about all these nutrients that we need to get into our diet. We talked about cooking them in our gut, absorbing them. Now we have to get them to our bones and joints. And how do we do that? The rule of artery is supreme. How many of you heard this before? All right, AT stills, right? This goes back to early osteopathy. We gotta get those, those nutrients into our bones. We gotta get them into our, our joints. And we do that through the arterial supply. So, you know, how does that affect, you know, what can we do? How does lifestyle affect it? Well, diet and lifestyle, can affect our, 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 our blood vessels, right? We heard a lecture earlier on stress and psychological health. Well, diet does the same thing. So the sad diet again, which is red and processed meats, processed foods, has been shown to contribute to endothelial dysfunction. You guys heard of endothelial dysfunction already. So endothelial dysfunction is pretty interesting. So Dr. Vogel took some patients, took them to McDonald's, McDonald's again, he had them eat a, eat a meal. Actually before he measured their, their blood flow with a uh, ultrasound, and then he had him eat a meal of McDonald's and then they measured afterwards and these blood vessels were just constricted. They would not relax. So for four hours after that meal, these blood vessels would not relax and the blood flow wherever it was going was decreased. So that's the endothelial dysfunction, that's the acute effect. And then the long effect is the atherosclerosis. So how does that affect your bones? Well, aortic calcification has actually been shown to be associated with bo decreased bone mineral density at the hips positive association with osteoporotic risk factors, and progression of aortic calcification was positively associated with progression of, or loss of bone mass, or bone mineral density. 
So we got to get those nutrients there. There's, look at this. I'm at the spine center. I love this picture. Look at the spine and the blood supply to it. You know, that aorta feeds the bones, the discs, the nerves, the spinal cord, all those muscles. So, you know, could a altered supply of blood to your spine create back pain? Anybody th heard of that before? Well, there's studies that show that, yeah. Aortic calcification and spine health. Degree of atherosclerosis of the abdominal aorta, especially stenosis of the lumbar and sacral arteries, is associated with a degree of degenerative disc disease and back pain episodes, too. And there's an association also between higher lipid levels, atherosclerosis, and, and disc herniations. So I show this to my patients all the time, this kind of, this kind of x-ray, that, hey, maybe you don't have enough blood flow to your spine. Same thing with the knees, the knee arthritis. So there's these lesions called the bone marrow lesions that are found in the subchondral bone. And they've been associated with worsening of arthritis. So actually these bone marrow lesions um, are in the subchondral bone and they decrease the flow of blood to the subchondral, or I'm sorry, to the um, cartilage. So about 50% of the nutrients and oxygen to the cartilage and to the joints comes from the subchondral bone. So if you have clogged up arteries into your bone and you have these bone marrow lesions in the subchondral bone, it actually increases your progression of arthritis, okay? So what can we do? Can we do something about lifestyle medicine? Can reverse atherosclerosis? Who's heard of Dean Ernish and his studies? Dean Ernish did a lot of interesting studies. He does the vegan diets, right? And his studies looked at patients going vegan, uh, moderate exercise, stress management, followed them for five years, and he looked at their coronary artery stenosis. And you can see uh, the patients that were following this diet, their arteries actually opened up, okay? Disease-modifying agents, right? their coronary artery blood vessels opened up. And the more, uh, the more you followed his program, the more likely you were gonna be successful. So I prescribe books to my patients, End of Dieting, uh, Dr. Fuhrman. Who's heard of Dr. Fuhrman? I strongly recommend you read his books. I prescribe the G-bombs, actually G-bombs with an extra S. And the G-bombs are greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, and the last S is for spices. I prescribe that every day to my patients. Who's heard of Dr. Esselstyn? So he's got a really nice book and had some really nice studies, looked at patients with coronary artery disease, uh, pretty significant stenosis um, and angiography. And for one month, they were actually three months, they were following his strict diet and his lifestyle changes. Three months later, they did a study again and it was open, poof. The arthrosclerosis was gone. And these patients, they were told, you're going to die in six, to, six months to a year. Seven years, ten years later, these people are, are alive, as long as they follow his program. So he says, eat greens three times a day. So I try that. I challenge myself, and I do that all the time. Can I eat greens three times a day? Who eats greens three times a day? There you go. You can do that. You can do that. So here's my breakfast. I have greens. Here's my lunch and my dinner. Greens three times a day. I challenge you to do that as well, and your patients. So exercise improves bone strength. Uh, aerobic exercise has been shown to improve bone mineral density, especially in the spine and postmenopausal women. Here's a nice study looking at about 60 women. They were given a walking exercise daily outside, again, in the sunshine. And they were walking outdoors at Vmax of 50%, four, four days per week. And they've been shown to actually have less bone mineral density loss. Actually, some of them improved, improved their bone mineral density. So this, this was very positive. Tai Chi has also been studied for uh, arthritis and osteoporosis and very positive studies. Actually, the Surgeon's General 2004 report on osteoporosis recommends Tai Chi for fall prevention. So we, in, in our clinic, we have a couple therapists that do Tai Chi, and when patients come in and they're very fragile and we need to work on their balance, their stability, we have them work with our, our, our therapists on Tai Chi treatment. But they can get Tai Chi anywhere. There's, you know, it's, all, it's all over our country. I also prescribe exercise for arthritis. Low intensity cycling was as effective as high intensity cycling in improving function and gait, decreased pain, and increased aerobic capacity in patients with arthritis. So, you know, I tell my patients, go outside and ride a bike. You don't have to go there and, you know, hustle for half an hour. Take your wife, take your husband, take your kids, go for a joyride for half an hour, have fun. Low intensity bike exercise works pretty well for knee arthritis. 
The other thing, mental health and bone health, depression, you know, depression can affect everything. Uh, decreases our exercise, causes sedentary lifestyle, changes your diet, uh, increases inflammation. So major depression is actually a risk factor for osteoporosis. And medications that we give to our patients for depression can worsen our bone health. Okay, SSRIs can actually change the way those osteoblasts and osteoclasts work. They, they affect the 5-HTT receptor in these cells, and they have been shown to actually worsen bone mineral density. So if when you see the patients like, I've been so healthy, what's going on? Why do I have osteopenia? And I've been on you know, an SSRI for 20 years. You know, think to yourself, could that have been contributing to us? So you know, what else can we do? You know, chronic stress is another thing, another risk factor for osteoporosis. Uh, stress causes increase in cortisol levels, decreases your gonadal hormones. So what can we do? We can actually teach them mind-body medicine for healing. This is a study looking of 30 participants, and they were, teach they were taught how to do a brain, uh, heart-brain coherence exercise for a month, and it increased their uh, DHA levels, DHEA levels, and we know that increases our gonadal hormones, right? It increases our bone strength, and it decreased their cortisol levels. This is the mind-body uh, exercise again. So this is the... Uh, heart, uh, heart coherence exercise. So when a patient starts a specific medication, uh, meditation, you can see that their heart rate variability neutralizes. And when it can stay there for, let's say, 10 minutes, it actually affects their hormone level, access, affects their stress level. So, you know, what do I do in my clinic? Um, I teach that to my patients. So there's a lot of studies on mind-body medicine. Brief relaxation techniques before and after surgery has actually shown to improve uh, healing it improves your collagen deposition, improves wound healing. And addition of hypnosis to patients with fracture have been actually shown to improve healing of that fracture, improve the weight bearing, and decrease their pain. So what do we do in our clinic? We teach them mindfulness meditation. Be like Buddha. So we do that. We, uh, many patients don't know how to meditate. So what I do is I tell them, do you have a smartphone? How many, how, many has, how many of you have a smartphone, right? Everyone. All your patients have a smartphone, therefore you can meditate. So we, there's apps, we use the Calm app or Stop, Breathe and Think, and just tell my patients, okay, use this app every day. Uh, it tracks your meditation. It, it, there's a woman with a pleasant voice that takes you through a meditation, tells you, you know, there's, you close your eyes, take a nice deep breath, and for 10 or 15 minutes, you do this meditation every day. Uh, I have an app as well, and I was showing my wife this morning, look, I have... 45 days in a row, I've meditated every day, 45 days. So the app tracks your meditation. So it's like a little challenge to yourself. You can have a community of meditators and you can see, well, look, you know, I'm meditating harder than you are. I don't know if that works, but. <laughs> so the, uh, the last part of the lifestyle medicine was toxic exposure. And this could be a whole lecture, a whole conference on its own. You know, toxic, we are exposed to toxins constantly. So the way we we expose ourselves to a toxin can affect our health, can affect our bone health. Lead, cadmium, aluminum, all of those things have been shown to increase uh, bone, uh, osteoporosis. And an organically grown food has actually 48% less of cadmium. And cadmium is one of those heavy metals that's been shown to increase your osteoporosis. And then we can have phytochelators, right? Who's heard of chelators? Chelation therapy. Well, there's phytochelation, which means plant-based chelators. Uh, cilantro is one of the you know, top ones. Chlorella, coriander, these are all wonderful things. And if you eat on a regular basis, they chelate these heavy metals and you eliminate them. Or you can give them toxins, right? You can give them opiates or NSAIDs, and opiates uh, decrease fracture healing, increase osteoporosis. So uh, me working in a spine pain clinic, I usually try to get my patients off narcotics as much as possible and then get them off cigarettes as well. So, what do you think? Is lifestyle medicine evidence-based medicine? Physical therapy, exercise, diet, bone broth. Am I just you know, practicing nuts and berry medicine or is this evidence-based medicine? So I, I, I challenge you, I challenge you to practice evidence-based medicine. I challenge you to practice lifestyle medicine. I challenge you to teach yourself, your patients and your kids, teach them to eat well, teach them to exercise, and teach them to meditate. Thank you very much. I'm going to take any questions, if there's any questions. And if not, thank you. Oh, there's a question right here. 
Do we roast the bones or just boil them? No, just go ahead and boil them. No, you don't need to roast them. Just put them in and you put in some, uh, some vinegar in there. It actually helps the bones to take out the minerals. Any other questions? Yes? Popcorn has antioxidant properties. I don't, I don't know. I don't prescribe popcorn, but if there is, great. Um, but, you know, corn tends to be one of those genetically modified, you know, ingredients that I tend not to prescribe. And a lot of people that have any bowel issues cannot tolerate popcorn, so I typically have my patients actually stay away from popcorn. Yes? What do I put in my morning? So always a cruciferous vegetable like kale or broccoli or, or spinach. Then I put usually below turmeric root, ginger root. I put an oil in there like a flaxseed oil because the oil actually helps you to absorb the fat soluble vitamins. Uh, and then I put some other vegetables and water maybe. Uh, what's that? No cumin. No cumin. Uh, no, I, I eat that. I put it in my, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a level of vitamin D3 that I shoot for? Uh, you know, usually it's between 40 to 50 typically. Again, you have to be careful because overshooting, sometimes there are some reports that can cause kidney stones and other things, but usually 40 to 50. Any other questions? Thank you very much.